Welcome everyone to this installment of Smart Inclusion. And today's conversation it'll, will be about women-owned businesses and overcoming the challenges in leadership. As Smart Search develops our HR technology platform to support diversity outreach in recruiting and hiring, we're talking with our clients, our vendor partners, industry advocates, and thought leaders about trends, challenges, and solutions for employers on how to create a more inclusive and diverse workplace. I'm your host, Sylvia Dalby at Smart Search, and I'm very pleased to introduce Lynn Marie Finn, the president and CEO of Broadleaf Results, which is a women-owned uh, W, what is it, W? So well, um, why don't we start by tell us a little bit about Broadleaf and how long your organization has been a WBENC certified uh, oh, woman-owned yes, business the acronym. So, um, and you can call me Lynn. I know everybody says Lynn Marie, but I have Lynn Marie because I'm was I married the Finn, so I'd be Lynn Finn. Anyway. Um, Broadly started actually back in the 60s as a, a traditional kind of commercial staffing company. Um, it became actually a actual woman owned company in 1997. Um, I wasn't involved at, at that point. Um, and it did not actually become uh, certified until 2003. And I was at, by that time I was involved and um, I didn't get certified because I think because I was stupid, <laughs> I, I felt that, well, I don't think I need this. We offer such great services. I don't need that. I, I think I looked at it as a crutch as opposed to looking at it as another tool in my box to differentiate me from competitors. Um, so I finally you know, got um, enlightened by a long-term client, which was ExxonMobil, and at the time they said, get certified by WeBank, the Women's Business Enterprise National Council. It's, a, it's the largest certification organization for women-owned businesses. So I did because my client told me to, right? So um, once that happened, a whole new world opened up to me. Um, I, I became very involved with WeBank. I was served on the board for almost a decade, I think. I received awards and recognition from them. I'm still involved with them as a Women of Distinction, which is basically their WBE Advisory Council. Um, and I also became involved in helping other women com women's companies get certified with WeBank and joined other women's business organizations. And I've, I'm still very involved in any business organization that advances women in business. It's really a passion of mine. I've met fabulous women and just accomplished women um, throughout the country, throughout the world that I would not have known, but for these organizations. So it was really one of the best things awesome. I've done for my business. Awesome. Um, you know, we have, as we talk to companies about their various initiatives to increase diversity and inclusion in the workplace, it's interesting to have that historic perspective on it. Um, as a female business owner, how did you find that seat at the table early in your career and what kinds of challenges did you experience when you first started in the workforce? I think you were initially an attorney. Yeah, yeah, well, um, I think gender equity has really um, advanced since my graduation from law school, which was quite a few decades ago. Um, and the law firm I joined after graduation, they had about 85 lawyers in it. And there were two law female lawyers already there and they hired myself and another recent female graduates. So there were four of us. And we were considered a, a progressive firm at the time to have four um, female lawyers. Um, and you know, there I was definitely placed in situations that I felt uncomfortable. I felt I was treated differently than male attorneys or maybe not totally accepted into the group. Um, but I also had male partners at the firm who mentored me, who um, really gave me full opportunity to succeed. So it was kind of a, a mixed bag, but I did realize, I think quite quickly, that I had to grab a seat at the table. Nobody was gonna give it to me. Nobody's gonna be holding that seat out for me to sit in. And um, 
So in, in that sense, you know, with law firms, it was competitive anyway. And I'm not sure if it was that much different with the, with the new male attorneys either. Mm -hmm. um, I think, though, my dad was always very much promoting me to have a career. I mean, he told me I could do anything I wanted in the world, um, but he wanted me to be a doctor or a lawyer. So I became a lawyer listening to my dad. So in the law firm, I didn't really dwell on the inequities maybe that I felt uncomfortable about or unfair incidents. I just kind of brushed them off, focused on work, which is probably not the most enlightened way to do it now because you're just um, you know, promoting the, these inequitable behaviors, I guess. But when I, I did leave the private practice of law and then you know, went into business and became my own boss. And when I did that, I became a lot more attuned to what gender disparity is. Um, and what it feels like not to be fully accepted um, in an organization and that there's still so much disparity in the opportunities for men and women at work. Um, and now it can have much more of an impact on that. Yeah, that's great. You know, back to the idea of the acronyms. Okay, we have the very popular acronym now, DEI for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, recently, I've noticed there's a new initial that's been added to the acronym, and that's B. So it's now DEIB, and the B stands for belonging, which is kind of what you were talking about, like trying to fit in. So what can you tell us about the new belonging uh, addition to the diversity, equity, and inclusion spectrum? So there is um, an increased focus and it expanded DEI to DEI and B, or sometimes you see DIB, just diversity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, and what this does, it, it's really a crucial thing that's been added because it recognizes that the journey doesn't end once a hire is made, especially if, if a diverse candidate is hired. Um, to retain employees, to make people successful in their job, companies have to make sure that the work environment is inclusive and it does foster belonging. And what does that mean? It's really, belonging is defined as um, the experience of being wholly accepted and included by those around you. It means feeling valued and, and that you can be your authentic self at work. And a lot of people ask, well, what's the difference between um, belonging and diversity and inclusion? And I, I've been reading about that. And you know, so diversity is kind of a fact. It refers to characteristics that make people unique. Inclusion is really sort of behaviors and cultural norms that people make people feel welcome. But belonging is that emotional outcome that people want in an organization where they work. And it refers to kind of an individual sense of acceptance. Yeah. And do you find that's especially true of young people? Like the younger generation is it really, that's what they're expecting? Um, yes, I think everybody wants to feel that sense of belonging. I think they're maybe more willing to be, to communicate about it and, 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 and to recognize that it's important. But I think anyone who's really been happy at work has felt that sense of belonging without maybe labeling it. Yeah, excellent And what's, what's important, I think, that we need to recognize now with, this you know, crazy labor market we have and with the um, remote work becoming so much more popular so quickly is that when, it, when remote work settings, it's gonna make it harder, especially for new hires to develop that sense of belonging. Hmm. And you know, let's, uh, let's talk about that. Like as a talent uh, acquisition provider, uh, I'm sure you've seen a significant increase in requests from companies that are looking for a more diverse uh, talent pool, as well as suppliers that are more diverse. So how has uh, Broadleaf and your organization been able to keep up with this increased uh, demand? And in particular, what types of sourcing strategies and recruiting strategies are you implementing in your programs to achieve these objectives for employers? So um, as I said, you know, we started as a commercial staffing company. Now we do managed service programs and recruitment process out, outsourcing. Managed service programs, we manage the entire process. We manage all of the temporary staffing companies used by the client for their temporary staffing needs. So we have the opportunity to educate both the client and the supplier on best practices in recruiting for diverse candidates or aligning certified diverse suppliers, such as MBEs, WBEs. So the, and one of the advantages of why companies like to engage Broadleaf as a WBE for their MSP provider is that 
all the contingent workforce revenue is invoiced by Broadleaf, so all the spend is counted as diversity spend. So we are kind of that consultant that comes in and you know come their diversity goals, and so they're um, they've got um, the, we have contractual SLAs then that we need to um, abide by to help them with their diversity goals. So we have to work with the um, suppliers in the program to make sure that they have a wide net. For, to get diverse candidates, which we help them. Where are you sourcing your candidates? Point them to our social media um, things that could be helpful for them. We organize job fairs for the clients in diverse communities, or we hold supplier summits with the clients so that they can get together, share recruiting challenges and um, stat strategies, best practices. And also we certainly engage diverse suppliers in our um, programs. And not on, you know, uh, unlikely, they often have a better track record of mm -hmm. sourcing diverse candidates than. Um, so it we, sounds like the, the couple of the keys to the strategy there would be communication and outreach to the more diverse talent pools and then to, and then exactly. The and then on, the, on the flip side of that, though, with the client, with the hiring managers or the talent acquisition department, we have to, we look at the job descriptions and, you know, is it focused on skill sets, not just do they have a certain previous experience in your specific industry mm -hmm. that more can, candidates can be considered? Are the job postings using unbiased language? Are they using consistent screening questions for all candidates for a particular role so that they're comparing apples to apples and we, we also work with hiring managers and sometimes it's a little uncomfortable but we try to make them aware of unconscious bias because we all have it mm -hmm. but ways to identify it um and so for a hiring manager we ask you know well what did you think about that candidate after an interview they'll say well i don't think they'd be a good fit well we need to probe that what does that mean does it mean their skills and qualifications aren't right or does it mean they're not a good cultural fit and is that an unconscious bias? So we really kind of have to dig deeper when we're providing that. On the, on the other services for recruitment process outsourcing, this is when we're doing large scale rec recruiting projects for our clients for you know, their direct hire. Um, you know, we could be in certain types of positions, geographies, whatever, we do what they need. We are an extension of their talent acquisition team. So they have their own DEI initiatives, but we will then again, share our expertise We'll help them reach their goals. We'll work, mm -hmm. bring in a lot of market data, community data, salary data to make sure that we can be, they can, you know, be an attractive employer for diverse candidates. No, I think I like what you're doing with the hiring managers to ask them to consider like what they mean by that, because to say, you know, maybe they're not a good cultural fit. You need to really drill in to get to the bottom of that and not have it used as a smoke screen to eliminate uh, Absolutely. Types Absolutely. of candidates. You know, let's flip that around. Okay, is Broadleaf actively working with diverse and minority candidates, and how it, can they succeed in the in, in the job market when they're out there looking for work and and put, position themselves as you know oh. the hot talent? Yes, I, and I think we do, and and you know we do this so much. We really have gotten. I think uh, a certain level of expertise. First of all, you got you got to get the word out in the right ways to a variety of communities and social media about the job openings because if job seekers don't know about it, they can't apply for it. So that you know dissemination is important. Where you do that, how you do that, we have to remove barriers in the hiring process. That means conducting interviews after hours on weekends, hold job fairs in diverse communities, or easily accessible locations, use technology to reduce friction in the whole screening and, and hiring process. We also have to show that candidate, what's the growth potential for this position? Um, employees wanna know where their potential is for career growth and they wanna have equal advancement opportunities. Mm -hmm. So to this end, we talk to companies and we encourage hiring managers to identify, is there internal staff who maybe, who are diverse that could fill a position, could maybe stretch with some training and development into this role. They're already the, they're calling that reskilling, right? Ex well, what reskilling, but the, you know, recognizing somebody there for their contribution and investing in them. That only strengthens that sort of sense of belonging, which is just a huge factor in employee uh, ret retention. Mm -hmm. So um, part of that communication and outreach needs to really include the internal 
employee population for advancement opportunities and for referrals, perhaps? Absolutely. And Absolutely. But there's a whole area that's being developed in the staffing industry called direct sourcing, which we engage in. And that is looking at all kinds of maybe your client databases in their ATS, obviously, system, but also in, um, you know, what, who are their retirees? Who are their silver medalists? People that they didn't give a job offer to, but they might be good for another job. You know, being, and again, in this tight labor market, you have to get every resource you have yeah. for candidates. I'm, um, I'm so tickled to hear you say the silver medalist because that's something I talk about a lot, right? The ATS, you know, as an ATS, <laughs> right. one of our <laughs> mission is that we don't want it to be the black hole, right? Like people that applied because you interviewed good people and there might be some silver medalists in there, people that you didn't make the offer or the hire. Maybe they didn't even decline the offer. These are people you absolutely want to find again and reconsider you know, if another opportunity presents itself, um, you know, yeah. let's uh... I mention one last thing, one last thing, um, Sylvia, that is just I so important. And it kind of it's, it's kind of related. And and that's you know, to where make sure as a company, you're providing ongoing training and mentoring, especially mentoring mm -hmm. and especially in a DEI and B context. You mentioned that it, with, in your law firm, right? The importance of mentors. Yes. To, and this is decades ago you. that I, and that fostered me, me feeling more integrated into that. But it, you know, studies have shown employees are just more engaged and they're more likely to feel they belong if an organization invests in their development. You know, so that's training, obviously, so they can do their current job well, but also training to make them ready for future roles. But mentoring is just one of the best ways to feel valued as an employee and to feel that they belong and it's a, just such a great retention tool and i think Agreed. you know you yeah. can hire somebody but if they don't stay what's the point right, right? no mentors and allies are, yes. are really important to uh to really promoting a diverse culture of inclusion and belonging so that i think is probably one of the biggest takeaways from today's conversation um you know one last thought uh uh, procurement departments, um, they have been very hyper focused on tracking diversity data within their workforce. Um, this is something that's emerged. We get a lot of requests for reports on this. Uh, we even did some work with a car on business intelligence that part of that was gleaning this information. So how has Broadleaf been able to keep tabs on this information for your clients? Because obviously, if you have the program, you need to have some way of measuring the result, right? Broadleaf results, as it were. Exactly. Let's talk about the I know. results I know. and how, exactly. you me how to measure the results and the effectiveness of what you're doing. Well, and that's where that's very important. So, you know, we're used to working with a lot of government contractors so that we're familiar with the responsibility they have to direct their diverse candidates and also their diverse spend on contracts. Um, but candidates, especially in the STEM positions, which historically have have been you know, a lack of women and minorities in those. So obviously we use we use tools, you know, we use smart search. We use, um, you know, any tracking tools to make sure that we're we're tracking the candidates um, that we present or the people that we hire as temporary employees. But also in our managed service programs with other suppliers, we have to flow that down mm -hmm. to all the suppliers and we, they need to track it. And we have, our clients require us to do diversity reports when we're doing all of our, our monthly and quarterly reports because they use that data themselves to measure you know, their success in meeting diversity goals, also for EEO reports. But, but more importantly, um, they use it, well, one, also because a lot of temporary employees especially now, are getting hired as direct employees. So the temporary supplier, staffing supplier, is the feeder candidate pool for these direct positions. But they, they also use it, though, just to see whether maybe are they doing something not quite right? Is there some intentional, unintentional alienation of some demographics? How are they, you know, they can measure when you get the data, you can slice and dice it and just measure what they're doing in different geographies or different positions to determine how successful their recruiting efforts are to attract diverse right. workers. Yeah, like what's working, what's not right. working, what can work, what can we improve? Wow, well, thank you very much, Lynn, not 
also known as Lynn Marie. Uh, I think you've given us a lot to think about, and I sure appreciate you sharing your insights, your experience and perspective today on smart inclusion as we explore the best practices in diversity, equity, and inclusion for the HR and recruiting communities. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It was so nice to talk with you and about this really important, as you can tell, I'm passionate about subject. And I'm so it's so great of Smart Search to be doing these kinds of, of um, interviews and, and sharing information. Well, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too, Sylvia. Bye. Bye now.